You've just built your brand new gaming PC, and while it looks absolutely fantastic with the lights on and fans spinning, the PC just doesn't seem to work. You can't get an output on your display. You've got error codes on your motherboard, your memory's not working quite right, or heck, you don't actually know what's wrong with it. Well, in this video, I'll be walking you through the most common issues people run into, crucially how to fix them, and the process that I personally use to try and diagnose a brand new gaming PC that just won't seem to work. Let's do this. The Corsair Frame 4000D is here and better than ever. With a spacious and fully modular design, you can configure this case to meet your build's exact needs. Improved airflow at the front and on the side helps to keep temperatures down, while Corsair's new InfiniRail mounting system allows you to adjust fan rails for added versatility and a cleaner aesthetic. What's more, it's compatible with reverse connector motherboards, 360mm all-in-one radiators, and comes with an integrated GPU anti-sag arm. Learn more and check it out at the first links in the description below. Feel free to use the timestamps below to navigate through specific issues, but I'm going to work through in order of the steps I would take from start to finish. Now let's start off with the worst case scenario. The PC doesn't turn on at all. You're hitting the power button, you're just not getting any action within the PC, no fans are spinning, nothing lights up. What on earth do you do? Now in this instance, the simple solutions are often the best. Check that the switch on the power supply is turned on and check that the power switch on your case is wired up correctly. What I would do is turn the power switch on the power supply on and then short the power pins on the motherboard. You want to look for the JFP1 connectors. These are most commonly located in the bottom right corner of your motherboard and you want to unplug the front panel cables you plugged in earlier. With the power supply switch firmly set to on, I'm then going to short the two pins that represent the power pins on the JFP1 and I'll pop a diagram on your screen now. Now shorting the two pins is basically using the end of a screwdriver to connect them together. You completing the circuit and triggering the power button. Now what that should do in theory is illuminate your system and get things going. But what if it doesn't? Very often people confuse their PC not booting up with things like the fans not not being powered up, connected, or spinning. Now in this particular build, all of the fans are wired up to the motherboard. That means as soon as the motherboard receives power, the fans will spin. You might have a case that's got a fancy controller on, and you might actually have forgot to plug the power for that controller up to get the fans spinning in the first place. Obviously things like your RAM lighting up are a telltale sign that the PC is in fact on, and similarly if you've got a light on your GPU, they're also good things to keep an eye on to see if the PC, despite fans not spinning, is actually trying to boot. But what if you don't have light up memory or a light up graphics card or any light up elements on your motherboard? Oh, well, when you go through the boot process on most boards, you actually have debug LEDs. And these are very commonly found in the top right hand corner. Now, one of the very first debugging steps you want to carry out on any build is to clear CMOS. This is going to reset the BIOS back to the start. And on most modern motherboards can be done very easily with a button at the rear. What you need to do is turn the PC off and very often also turn off the power supply or unplug the power completely. Some motherboards allow you to do this while the motherboard receives power and is actually turned on, some do not. Check your motherboard's manual for instruction. We'll pop the few most common methods on your screen now, and you can see on this Asus motherboard how we're going to go about doing that. Clearing CMOS will reset any settings in the BIOS that may have been changed or may have been set differently to what the manufacturer recommends out of the box, and very often clears more issues than you might think. It's a great setting to use as well if, for example, you've overclocked your memory and are now seeing instability, maybe can't get back into the BIOS, take things back to how they were. If you are facing instability within the BIOS, try changing one setting at a time, as clearing CMOS will get rid of everything. So it tends to be a bit of a last resort, as any hard work you've carried out changing settings you do need to be different and that do work will of course be undone. And this brings me to my next step. What to do to determine whether the PC is booting, or what to do if the PC just won't output a signal but appears, like this, to be on. Now these debug LEDs are your best friends, and often come in two forms. More simple of affordable motherboards have four lights that light up in sequence. More expensive motherboards will have the same four lights as well as a Q code display. This is a small screen that displays a two digit hexadecimal number. Now what you want to do is go ahead and turn the PC off once again. Why? Because we want to get it absolutely ready for an optimal boot state before checking out what these LEDs are doing. For that you're going to want to grab yourself a keyboard, <laughs> a little something like so. You'll also want to grab yourself a mouse, this one is garishly pink and black, and you'll also want to grab yourself a monitor. Now this is a very, very overkill, but very fancy MSI QD OLED panel with a crazy high refresh rate. Yeah, and it's just really very nice. You obviously don't need something quite this expensive, but a monitor you do need to have 
plugged in. Some of the boards are actually more picky than others at this stage. And the reason you need a keyboard and mouse plugged in is that very often some PCs just won't boot without a keyboard connected. It actually classes as an error on the motherboard and will prevent you hitting the boot stage. You also want to make sure that the display cable for the monitor is plugged into the graphics card and not to say, for example, the back of your motherboard. This is because either best case you'll get the graphics from the CPU, which are not good enough for gaming. Worst case, you may have a CPU with no integrated graphics and the HDMI or DisplayPort connection on the back of the board does nothing. Now, if your monitor is the kind that actually turns on without having a device or a signal connected, now's also a great time to actually turn the monitor on and change the input to make sure it's set to the same connector as what you'll be using. So for example, in this build, I'm using HDMI 1. So I'm gonna set the monitor to HDMI 1. If your monitor's like this and doesn't want to boot without an active device connected, you can actually plug in another device that you know is working, set the input to HDMI 1 or DisplayPort rather than the automatic setting just to help alleviate another common problem. Very often when the PC is trying to output a signal and your monitor's on auto, it's cycling through the display inputs and just can't quite catch the PC. And when you're first booting up, that can present a problem. I've seen it way more often than you might think. Once the PC is powered up, I'm again gonna use my screwdriver to short the power pins. And then I'm gonna hammer the delete key on the keyboard. Repeatedly pressing this should tell the PC that we want to go into the motherboard BIOS. This can often be a better step than trying to boot into a Windows drive as again, Windows will often have various issues and this is gonna help alleviate that as a potential problem. Aha, and we are in. So we're now into the motherboard BIOS. Now this is a good point to have a look around the system and do a general health check. Make sure all of the components you installed are displaying in the BIOS correctly and nothing's missing. So up here we can see that we've got our Ryzen 9900X processor in this build with 32 gigabytes of DDR5 memory running currently at a very slow 4400 megahertz. Don't change this, leave it exactly as it is for now. I'm also gonna check that things like the RAM are installed into the correct slots. You can see here we've got A2 and B2 and you can see we've got two matching DIMMs, that's good. You may have it where a DIMM's not quite installed correctly and that will actually show here that the DIMM just doesn't appear. I'm also gonna take a look at temperatures. Now you can see here that the motherboard temp is 24 and our CPU temperature is at 32 degrees. That is good. When your CPU is under a low usage state, you shouldn't be exceeding 40 or 50 degrees on your temperature. If you boot into the BIOS and the CPU's sitting at say 85 degrees Celsius, your cooler isn't on correctly. Either that or the cooler is on correctly, but you haven't plugged the pump in or there's no fan spinning on the radiator. You want to address this now is when you go ahead and install Windows, which is often the next step for lots of people, you're gonna see a higher CPU load, which is gonna push the temperature too high and probably force the system to shut down to save your all important CPU. So I'm happy with the temperatures. I can also see the NVMe drive is all in, which is good. I'm then gonna hit F7 to jump into advanced mode. And what I want to find is this boot override setting. On this Asus board, it's in the boot menu, but in some of the boards, it will be in the exit menu. Now what boot override is gonna do is ignore our boot priority. So it's gonna ignore whatever device we're saying we're gonna boot into. And instead it allows us to click straight into a drive. Now, if you're installing Windows via a bootable USB, I've got a full tutorial on that in the cards now, you want to boot override into the USB drive. If your drive already has Windows, you want to boot into the Windows boot manager drive on the SSD. Now clicking this actually puts us straight into boot. And very often I've seen new PCs that don't like booting into a Windows drive, even if it exists straight away. They actually prefer to go through the BIOS on the initial stage until your drivers and other software configuration is done. And then it will just boot like normal without the BIOS needing to get in the way. So you can see here we're in Windows. And again, what I'm gonna check at this stage is Task Manager and do just a quick system health check. I'm gonna go ahead and open up our Task Manager window, go to performance and make sure that everything is all detected. So we've got our AMD Radeon GPU. That's not quite right because we've got a GeForce card. So that implies that it's the integrated graphics on the processor. We haven't got any GPU drivers. And we're also gonna take a look and make sure that the CPU and that the memory is all displaying as correct. And that all of the drives used in the system are showing as well. But what if you've not got this far? What if the system won't go into BIOS? And what about those four pesky LEDs I talked about earlier? Now to show this, I'm gonna rewind back to the boot up of this system. And here you can see progressively the CPU, memory, VGA and boot LEDs illuminate in that order. Now what this is doing is it's going through the boot process. It's checking, are we happy with the CPU? That includes things like, is the CPU installed? Is the CPU too hot? Is the CPU compatible? It's then gonna to go to memory and check again, is the memory compatible? Can it pass all of the memory validation checks? Before then going to VGA and checking, is the VGA compatible? Is the power cable plugged in? Does it work? Does it exist? Can I use it? And then jumping into boot. So let's talk about what happens if you get stuck on each of these LEDs and start with CPU. Now the most common reason someone would get stuck on the CPU light is because of an incompatible motherboard BIOS. 
This can happen if you buy an older B650 motherboard and use a new Ryzen 9000 CPU. The motherboard requires a BIOS update. To do this, you need to flash the motherboard's BIOS, which I'll show you how to do in the next step. If you're stuck on the memory phase, the best thing to do is just to take all of the RAM out and install one DIMM. It might be that the memory is not compatible with the motherboard or that the memory is trying to run quicker than the motherboard can handle. You can configure lots of these things later and the important step now is to get your memory working and the PC booted. Updating the BIOS, as I'll cover in a moment, is also a great way to fix some memory and compatibility issues. And if you buy a motherboard chipset very early on, as soon as those boards come out, you'll find that there are lots of BIOS updates available online that fix memory issues more than most other problems. If you get stuck on VGA, that can often mean that the graphics card needs to be reseated. I'll cover that in a moment's time. It could also mean the graphics card doesn't have any power or that it's not quite in the PCI slot correctly. If you get stuck on boot, this more than likely means the PC cannot output a signal to your monitor. This can happen if the PC has before outputted a 4K signal and is now plugged into a lower res 1080p panel. It can happen if your monitor is not on and ready to accept a signal. Some PCs struggle to wake monitors, so try turning your monitor on immediately before pressing the power button on the system. And at this stage, it can be worth trying both a different cable, a different connector type, so HDMI and DisplayPort, and even a different monitor if you have one. If you don't have a spare monitor, try plugging into a TV, as TVs are historically very good at accepting lots of different signals at different resolutions, refresh rates, and formats. The best course of action though, when you have problems at this stage, other than checking everything's physically plugged in, is to flash the BIOS. So here's how you wanna do that. On most boards, this is a fairly simple process. Simply grab a blank USB formatted to FAT32, download the BIOS file from the motherboard manufacturer's webpage, and rename this to whatever's specified by your motherboard manufacturer. You then want to turn the PC off and power it down, plug your newly formatted USB into the outlined port on the rear I.O. of the motherboard, and hold down the BIOS flash button while the board does its thing. This process will often complete in around five to 10 minutes, and your motherboard will have an LED that signals once this has been finished. So you've flashed your motherboard BIOS, but things still aren't working. Now is a good time to start reseeding some of your main components. Now, in order to do that, what you're going to want to do is turn the system off. Unplug the power cable just to be safe. You're not gonna get electrocuted, but it always helps to have this out. And then I'm gonna go ahead and reseed the memory and the graphics card. So let's start with the RAM. Now to do this is just the same as installing the RAM, but in reverse. You'll find some clips on the top and typically also on the bottom. This board's fancy, so it only has them on the top. And I'm gonna take the memory out. What I'm then gonna do is just return one of the RAM DIMMs into place. Of course, you're going to want to get all your memory working in the end, but installing one RAM DIMM will help to troubleshoot and keep things a bit more simple. I'm then gonna unplug the graphics card, remove any GPU support brackets and unplug the graphics card power cable. So apply some pressure to the clip and pull this out. And most graphics cards are gonna be secured with just two screws on the left hand side. So what I'm gonna do is locate those two screws and go ahead and remove them. You then need to release the graphics card. Often there's a clip on the PCI lane, but this Asus board is fancy. All you have to do, I believe, is just pull it out. There's no clip, it's all automatic. Now with the graphics card out, I can show you the important bit. And that is this gold contact strip right here. This here is passing all of the data to and from the graphics card and the motherboard. And very often this can actually become unseeded from the main PCI slot. Now the best way to check that you're happy with this is simply to reinstall the graphics card. Make sure that it's all aligned nicely and give it a firm push into place. You can also go ahead and take a look at the top of the GPU. For this board, I'll need to just remove the M.2 heatsink. And what you want to make sure of is that at the top of the graphics card, there's no gold showing. All of the gold metal contact should be within the PCI slot itself. I'm then gonna pop the M.2 heatsink on this board back into place. Just helps to have a clear view of these kind of things. And I'm gonna return the power cable into place. Listen carefully for a click. That is really, really important. Now, very occasionally, if you've got a slight incompatibility between the graphics card and the case, screwing it in can actually pull it out the slot. This is because when you screw it in, you're essentially pushing the graphics card in at the front, which can cause it to kick out at the back. So rather than screwing it in, I'm going to leave it to rest for now. If it's particularly loose and you're worried about putting pressure on your board, you can pop any integrated GPU support bracket underneath just to stop it from going anywhere. I'm then gonna go ahead and turn the PC back on, plugging up both the power cable and the HDMI cable 
available to the GPU. I'm then gonna go ahead and short those motherboard pins again from earlier. You can of course pop your front panel cable connector back on if that was indeed the problem and then hit delete again and hopefully end up once again in the motherboard BIOS. Now in real time, this is gonna take around about 10 to 20 seconds. It can be quicker than this. Equally, it can also be slower. It will always happen normally after your peripherals have lit up and you can see, boom, I'm in. Again, at this stage, if you're having a problem, go ahead and actually turn the monitor on immediately before powering up the PC. Some monitors are a little bit more tricky to work with in that respect. The next stage though is the power supply. And this is another common area where people tend to slip up. Now getting these cables correctly installed is a really, really important factor. And actually been quite contentious in the news recently where people have had their high powered GPU cables actually melt because they haven't been inserted all the way. It's the same principle for things like the CPU cable and motherboard power cables too. And it's the same reason that I unplugged the JFP1 front panel connector earlier. That's because if you've got it in the wrong way around, hitting the power button may just be shorting the wrong pins. And as such, causing the PC not to boot. But what if you're having problems within Windows itself and actually you've got a corrupt Windows installation, you can't seem to get into the drive, what do you do then? Well, for me, I would advise a fresh Windows install. So follow the same steps we've had here, jump into your motherboard's BIOS, and then what we're gonna do is overwrite Windows on the current drive with a brand new installation. To do this, you want to take yourself a Windows 11 USB and plug it into one of the USB 3 ports on the back of the motherboard. What we're going to need to do is turn the PC off and then go back into the BIOS it's not going to detect it by simply plugging it in, at least not in most cases. Turn the motherboard back on. I'm going to short the pins once again to get into the BIOS. Go ahead and hit the delete key and then jump through the same steps as earlier. So hit F7 to go into advanced mode. Go to the boot section and I'm going to find the USB flash drive for our boot override. Head into that and we're going to then start the Windows reinstallation process. Now, the reason this can be important is very often when people have PCs that don't work, they tend to boot cycle the systems a lot. So they'll turn the PC on, it doesn't work, turn it off, turn it on. And by doing this, if the PC has booted, but just simply not outputted a display signal, you can easily corrupt your Windows install. It's why I always recommend a fresh Windows install on any new gaming PC. And you can still keep your old file and game data by adding this to a secondary storage drive, which you place in later. Now the Windows installation is pretty simple. And as I say, I've got a full tutorial on this on the channel. What you want to do is you want to click install Windows 11. And then when you get to the drive section, which I believe is the next stage, you want to wait for the disks to load in. And once they have, you want to delete all of the partitions. So disk zero is our main drive. If you've got spare drives, take these out. Because otherwise you might be in a spot of bother and you might not know which one is the correct one to delete or worse, delete your valuable family data. And then we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna delete all of the partitions on disk zero. As I say, be aware that anything that's now on there will be gone. As I mentioned, please do back up any of this data as by deleting the partitions, the information is now going to disappear. And that should give you one disk full of unallocated space. So we only want one partition on disk zero and hit next. You're then gonna go ahead and carry on with the Windows install on this drive and get things started from fresh. Be aware that this process will restart a few times and I have seen it where the PC will keep booting back into the USB, making it look like the installation has failed. It hasn't, you're just booting into the same drive to reinstall Windows again and again. So once it's finished, unplug the USB and that should force the PC to boot into your newly created boot drive. And those are the steps that I would use to debug a brand new gaming PC. Of course, one thing we have really touched upon is hardware failure. Hardware failure is a very real thing and of course exists in many instances, but it's a lot more uncommon than it used to be. And in all my years of building a gaming PC, I've only ever had one dead motherboard. I've never had a dead graphics card, never really had a dead SSD or even dead memory. So this is something that's increasingly unlikely. Now obviously be aware as well if you've bought a pre-built gaming PC like those we sell uh, here in the UK on geekerpc.com, a system that travels built over a distance is more likely to run into occasional boot issues than perhaps one you've built yourself. That's because despite the best efforts of any PC building company and all the packing material in the world, shipping a complete PC can be quite a challenge. And depending on the impact sustained in shipping, you'd be surprised what it is we see through our doors in terms of problems. But hardware failure for a DIY system that you've assembled from out of box components is incredibly uncommon. There are of course certain user inflicted issues too. If you bend a pin on the CPU socket, you're pretty much certain 
reason for the system to fail to boot or at best see system instability issues. But out of box component problems tend to be far and wide nowadays. If you do think you have got a defective component, the best thing to do is to reach out to the retailer and the manufacturer you bought the component from. Very often, they'll RMA the product, see if there's a problem, and if there is, try and fix it or provide a replacement. But make sure things like the memory you buy are on the official QVR list for the motherboard and double check whether your motherboard does or doesn't need a BIOS update to be compatible with your CPU of choice. Hopefully this has helped you get your next gaming PC up and running. Let me know if you found any oddities. If you had any problems you've solved that I haven't mentioned today, let me know in the comments down below. Thanks for watching and as always, we'll see you in the next one.